just a few announcements. Uh, one of them is that we will have a session meeting after the service. So please be with us here after the service if you are part of the session. Also, I'd like to announce that this will be the first, the official start of a series on the Evangelical Presbyterian Church Essentials. I wanted to preach through all the things that are absolutely essential to the EPC. So as we're entering, as, had, as we have entered this denomination, we can see what are the things that are at the very core of it. And I preached the unofficial first sermon a few weeks ago when I talked about the authority of Scripture. Because what's at the base of all the essentials is that we take it all from Scripture. That our only authority is what God has spoken to us through the Scriptures. And all the rest of the things that are most important to us come out of that. So I'd like to read the first essential to you today, and this is what I'll be preaching about later. The first essential of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church is that we believe in one God, the sovereign creator and sustainer of all things, infinitely perfect, and eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To him be all honor, glory, and praise forever. So today I'll be preaching about the Trinity. Next announcement is that today is the last day for permission slips for the youth group, both for the Waldemere trip as well as the Tapima Junior retreat. So if you're going to be going to either of those, please get in your forms today. Also, in a little bit, I'll be bringing up the supervisor of the children's services team who is in charge of foster care, Mandy Weaver. And so she'll be up here in just a few moments to speak to us. And so if anyone here might have a heart for foster care, or just maybe if you wouldn't be a foster parent yourself, Maybe to be able to support that ministry, uh, then you can be listening to what she has to say. And after the service, she'll be in the Sunday school right over there for a little bit of extra time. So she'll be up in just a little bit. Uh, also, because we have a few extra elements in our service today, we'll be skipping the congregational choice forms. That's all. A couple more announcements is that there will be a youth group tonight at 5 o'clock. And Tuesday at noon is the Brown Bag Bible Study. Wednesday there is no Martha Circle. And next Sunday there will be breakfast for the church family at 8 <coughs> So ma'am, if you please come forward and share with us. Thank you. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and talk with you today. Um, there's a great need for foster parents in Ashtonville County. Just to give you an idea of some of the numbers of kids and families we're working with, we currently have 36 licensed foster homes in Ashtonville County, and we're working with 185 children. So looking at those, the math of those numbers, not all those 80, 185 children are placed within those 36 homes. Unfortunately, there's times there's no appropriate family members or friends to care for children who come into the care of Ashtabula County Children's Services. And if we're not able to place within one of our foster homes, we have to look outside of our county, either through a private foster care network or through a group home, which makes visiting with their families and friends here all the more difficult. The goal of foster care is to get the children home with their families as quickly and as safely as possible. Um, so I am reaching out to faith communities, hoping that some of you may have an interest. Um, the reality is that most families can become licensed as foster homes. There's a lot of myths out there related to um, working parents and single parents and the ages of people who can be foster parents, and most of those are myths. So I would encourage you that if you have an interest, or maybe you know someone who you think would have an interest, if you could see me afterwards, we can talk about it. I think it needs some more information, um, and so you can you know look into that as well. Um, you know, and most importantly, though, um, certainly if you could pray for those involved, um, the burden is very heavy. Um, the children coming into foster care are coming in with a lot more issues. Um, bringing them into care, abuse, neglect, drug issues. So certainly, if you don't feel called to be a foster parent, if you could pray for those who are, I would appreciate it. Um, and again, I'll be available afterwards if you would have any questions. Thank you. Now for the call to worship. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let us see, Lord, and all that Let the fields 
page 8, come down my hand. You're number 8, come down my hand.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Not even Rachel this time? <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I have a very simple question for you this week. What is the Trinity? A name? Some people might be named Trinity, that's right. What's Trinity in the Bible? Um, that you get the same response. <laughs> the Trinity is God. Did you know that God is in three persons? Of God the Father, of God the Son. Does anyone know who God the Son is? That's right, it's Jesus. Jesus is God. He's a man and God at the same time. Isn't that hard to understand? And then there's another person of the Trinity. We've got God the Father, God the Son. Is anyone another the third? God the Holy Spirit. And so God is three and one at the same time. Can anybody explain that? No? No? no. Unless if you had a Bible. Well, you know, even when you go to the Bible, it can be confusing. But as we go to the Bible, as we learn more and more about God, we can start to understand the Trinity a little more each time we read. And as we understand the Trinity, we can understand who God is more and how to worship Him. So you please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you uh, that even though some things are very hard to understand, that you help us in understanding them. And we ask uh, for everyone here that you help us to understand more and more what it means that you're both three and one at the same time, and use that to bring us closer to you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now you can go be dismissed to Children's Church downstairs.
Uh, so Addie's seemingly doing well, but they're still going to go and check to see if she's eating too. Okay, and what day is that?
As we understand who God is more in the Trinity, we get closer and closer to Him. And we see in our scripture for today in the book of Matthew, if you'll turn there with me, that it's not you know, just for you know, some super Christians that want to get you know, really deep into their relationship with God, but this is actually a basic of Christianity. This is an essential. And it's so essential that in Jesus' last words to the church, he brings up the Trinity. So in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, we'll start there at verse 19, we'll see that Jesus gives the marching orders to the church, that when he's gone, He's sending them out to go and make disciples of all nations, to teach those people to follow Jesus' commandments. And he says to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So it's at the very basis of Christianity is that we are baptized into the name of the whole Trinity. And so we'll go through the scripture and see how important this is, and later we'll step through each person of the Trinity so we can understand them just a little bit more. You will not understand the Trinity 100% at the end of this sermon, uh, because I don't understand it 100%, so even if I had 100 sermons to give it, I couldn't communicate all of it. But we'll understand just a little bit better, and we'll see why it's so important to our faith. So if you'll please rise with me, and turn to book of Matthew, the 20th chapter, starting verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So we'll start with the first person of the Trinity. We'll start with God the Father. And so we'll be talking about how each person of the Trinity is God and why that matters. Now, starting with God the Father is a little awkward because no one really argues that God the Father isn't God. You know, if you look back throughout all of church history, all the things that the church has argued about, you don't really see a church council where somebody raises their hand and says, here's an idea. I don't think that God the Father is God. You know, with all of the things that the church has figured out about throughout all time, it's never really come up. And I don't think that anyone here walked in with this deep quandary of, you know, is God the Father really God? We tend to actually think the opposite. It's the opposite problem. We think, well, isn't God the Father the only God? You know, isn't it just God the Father? And he's God, but he also has a son, and he also has a Holy Spirit. Yeah, whatever that happens to be. You know, we just think, well, I, I thought that we believed in one God, not three gods. And you're right, we do believe in one God. We can see right here in the scripture that Jesus says that we're to baptize people in the name, not the names, but the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So we do believe in one God, but that God is a trinity. That God is three and one at the same time. That word trinity, if you break it into, you have tri and unity. And tri means three, like a tricycle has three wheels, and unity means together. And so, God is both three and one at the same time. Uh, now, this, of course, is complicated and hard to understand. And whenever something is hard for us to understand, we always try to come up with a physical example that helps us out. And so the great thing about physical examples is that it's something that we have experience with. You know, it's something that we can hold in our hand and say, I can wrap my mind around this. This is an everyday object. And it's much easier than just thinking about these ethereal things that happen before time. The only problem with physical examples about the Trinity is that they're all heretical. So anytime anybody gives you a physical example of the Trinity, there's something wrong with it. Now, you may have heard an example of an egg before. It's a very common example. People say the egg is like the Trinity. Because you can pick up an egg and say, this is one egg. And no one will argue with you. It's just a very simple object, one egg. And if you take that egg and you crack it open, you can say, now it's three. I've got a shell and yolks and whites. But the problem with that, even though it's easy to understand, is that that's not how the Trinity works. The Trinity is the three separate parts that together make up God. It's not like God the Father is one third of a God, and God the Son is another third, and God the Holy Spirit is a third. If you piece them together just the right way, you get one. So the Trinity isn't like an egg, and it's also not like water. That's something people will use to try to describe the Trinity. They'll say water is both three and one. You know, it's one in the sense that it's always H2O. It's the same chemical compounds. But if you freeze it, it's ice. And if you warm it up, then it's water. And if you warm it up again, then it becomes steam. 
But the problem with that is that God isn't just one person in the Trinity at any time. He's not a shapeshifter. It's not that, you know, one time God is God the Father, and that he needs to come to earth, and so he changes into God the Son, and then later he decides he wants to be the Holy Spirit, so he just turns himself into, you know, some sort of mist. It's not the way that the Trinity works, because both, I'm sorry, not both, but all three, uh, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son, and God the Father, have always existed at the same time, and they've always been together in a relationship. God's been in a relationship with himself, all the parts of the Trinity, from before there was time. And a relationship is actually the easiest way for us to understand a little bit about the Trinity. Because we can see it's the way that they relate to each other that makes them distinct. And so as we look at God the Father, as many attributes as he has, we can see him as the God, the part of the Trinity, who sends. The God the Father comes up with a plan, and he sends God the Son and God the Holy Spirit to accomplish it. It's like this. Uh, sometimes I will have a plan, and I will send Jack to accomplish that plan, even though he's you know, just a little one. Because ever since he has had legs and has been able to repeat what I say, I will use him as a messenger bird. And so if I'm all the way on one side of the house, Jack is with me, and Sarah's on the other. If I'm too lazy to get up myself and go over and talk to her, I'll say, Jack, I've got a special job for you. And he jumps right up. He's always eager to do it. And I'll say, go tell Mama, where did I put the leash? <laughs> and so he's very happy to submit to my you know, will and go and do this task that I've given him. And so he jumps up like a miniature Paul Revere with this great fervor, and he runs through the house screaming, Where's the leash? Where's the leash? And he gets to Sarah, and she'll tell him, and he'll come running back through the house, and he'll say, The garage door! It's on the garage door! And so I had a plan, and I sent my son to go accomplish that plan, and so then I, I know where the leash is. I'm glad that Sarah knows where I put all of these things, because I never do. And so God the Father, in that same way, sends God the Son and God the Holy Spirit to accomplish his plan. And God's plan is the salvation of his people. And so he comes up with that plan, and he sends God the Son to die for his people. And he sends God the Holy Spirit to convert us so that we want to accept Jesus' sacrifice. So we can look at God the Father and understand him as the person of the Trinity that comes up with a plan for the universe and sends God the Son and God the Holy Spirit to accomplish it. So that's the first person of the Trinity. The second is God the Son. So Jesus Christ is God. Now this is something that's been debated by the church before. Some of the very earliest church councils were heated debates where some people said that Jesus is God, other people said that he's not God, and they searched the scriptures and saw very clearly that while he was man, he was God at the same time. And let me tell you why it's so important that Jesus is God. Because if Jesus is not God, we are in a world of trouble. Because God's whole plan for the salvation of people was for a sacrifice to come down and take the punishment that we deserved. And so it had to be a, a fitting sacrifice. It had to be someone who lived a perfect life and was infinitely perfect and worthy. And humanity had thousands of years to come up with that on our own. You know, we built up an awful lot of sin and we had time to produce one human being that could take the fall. And as you look throughout all the scriptures, all these people that are usually described as biblical heroes, if you dig deep enough, they turn out to be biblical villains, because every single one of them has sin in their life. And so for thousands of years, we couldn't find one person to fit this role. And so God came to do it. It needed to be God himself who paid for our sins, because none of the rest of us could do it. And just think about the amount of sin that Jesus came to die for. The sin of all of God's people. You know, it boggles the mind just to think of our own personal sin. You know, if, if you think about every time we sin, we had to pay for that. You know, some people will have a swear jar, and you say a bad word and put a dollar in the jar. What if you expanded that? It wasn't just a swear jar, it was a sin jar. You know, you, you say a bad word, you put a dollar in the jar. You, know, you covet something, dollar in the jar. You gossip dollar in the jar. You, know, you think a nasty thought about somebody, a dollar in the jar. You go all the way back to your childhood, every time you disobeyed your parents, a dollar in the jar. Pretty soon we'd run out of dollars and we'd start stuffing it full of IOUs. Uh, but we know that the penalty for sin is not a dollar. It's eternal separation from God. 
the penalty for sin, Romans tells us, is death. And so we would be filling up that jar with IOUs to say, IOU, you want eternal separation. And our own personal jars would be brimming with IOUs that none of us on our own could pay. And so if you imagine your own personal jar that's just bursting at the seams, and if you go and find all the other all the other people in the world that are God's people, and you decide to pull them all together and stuff all those IOUs in one big jar, that's what Jesus came to die for. That's the tab that he came to pick up. And who here wants to pick up that tab of all of those eternal separation from God IOUs? <coughs> and we can't even deal with our own, let alone for all of God's people. But because Jesus is perfect and sinless, and God himself is infinite, when he came down to earth and he died, he took all of that punishment that should have been on us. And that's why it's so important that Jesus Christ is God. And so we can look at Jesus and we see he's the person of the Trinity that God the Father sent to die in our place so that our sins could be paid for. And that leads us to the third person of the Trinity, which is God the Holy Spirit. And I think that the Holy Spirit is the forgotten person of the Trinity. Because very often someone will come up to me and say, you know, I'd love to come learn more about God and Jesus. And I'm always just waiting. Are they going to say it? They almost never do. They almost never say the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's almost like, you know, if you're going to a fire safety course, and someone came up to the instructor and said, you know, I'd really love to learn about stop, drop, And roll, there we go. It's very important. If you were on fire, you stop, you drop, and you roll. If you just drop there, then you're just on fire, on the ground. It doesn't do you any good. And in the same way, you know, we just leave out this entire person of the Trinity so many times. The Holy Spirit is a person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is God. And so, you know, people just kind of leave him out. But the thing that the Holy Spirit does is crucial to our faith. Because... God the Father sends God the Holy Spirit inside of us to convert us so that we are able to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And this may not be something that you've heard a lot. You know, a lot of us think, well, you know, I believe that I'm saved by grace, but I'm the one who chose to accept Jesus. Uh, but just on our own, we can't accept Jesus because Jesus to all of us in our natural state is offensive. You know, and his book is offensive. Now, I preach from an extremely offensive text. As you go through the Bible, it is full of all of these things about sin. And as sinners, when we read it, we should be offended. You know, if you read the Bible and you are not offended in some way, you're not really paying attention. Because all of us are sinners, and it calls us out on that. And it says what you're doing isn't right. You need Jesus to be your Lord. And our first response is, you know, I'm going to be my own Lord. I don't care what you say. You know, who wants Jesus to be your Lord when you could be your own? And you want to say, well, this, you know, this isn't a sin. You know, the Bible might say it's a sin, but I decide that it's not. You know, everything about who God is is offensive to us because we were born with a sinful nature. We can't take it the first time. And it reminds me of the first time that Jack tried to eat carrots, strangely enough, uh, because Jack, in his natural state, hated carrots. And I wasn't there the first time that he tried carrots. Uh, but Sarah gave him a bite, and his reaction was so funny that she ran and got the video camera for the second bite so that I could see it. And now we have it for the rest of time. And I'll still go back and watch this child eat carrots for, the, I guess, the second time. But when she put the carrots in his mouth, I mean, you can't adequately, you know, duplicate it, but the expression on his face was just like she was feeding him poison. And he went, ah. <laughs> and he kind of, you know, let it go around his mouth some more, and ah. And then he swallowed it. And he sat there for a little while, and the aftertaste came, and that was the biggest one. Ha ha ha! He's in his chair, just convulsing around. He hated, hated, hated carrots. But we don't want picky eaters, so she just kept making him eat carrots. And eventually, he developed a taste for carrots. And now the boy will just pick up a carrot stick and go work on it. And it's because Sarah converted him into a carrot lover. You know, at first, in his natural state of being, he did not like carrots. But because his mother wanted him to, now he likes carrots. And in that same way, because our Father wants us to love him, he converts us. And he does that by sending the Holy Spirit. And you know, this may be abundantly clear to you from your faith journey. Maybe there was a long time where you said, I don't want God. You know, this is for somebody else. I'm not going to do it. 
and then you really noticed that he was working in you and changed your mind. Uh, that may not be your story. Maybe the first time you heard it, you said, you know, yes, I do want this. But if so, then you were fortunate enough to have the Spirit work in you the first time you saw Scripture. Because God sends, God the Father sends God the Holy Spirit inside of us to convert us into people that want to accept the sacrifice that Jesus made. People that can look at Scripture and say, you know, there's part of me, there's a little bit of sinful nature that says that this is offensive, but there's also the Holy Spirit inside of me that says it's offensive to your old self, but your new self wants this. Your new self wants to please God and follow God and live this life and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. And this isn't the only thing that the Spirit does. It's not a one-time thing where the Spirit comes once and converts you and then leaves you to do other things. The Spirit stays inside of Christians. So as you continue to live in your life, He is sanctifying you to make you more and more like Christ. And so the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, is the one that God the Father sends into us to convert us and change us into people who want to accept Jesus' sacrifice who makes us into Christians. So some people might say, you know, well, you know, it's all grace, it's all Jesus, that's why I'm saved. And yeah, that is one-third true. It is Jesus. But it's also God the Father, as well as God the Holy Spirit. Because God the Father comes up with a plan to save us. And God the Son came to die in our place. And God the Spirit applies it to us. And so, the question that's very difficult with this a very high concept is how does this affect our life? And this is something that you need to think about. And with every sermon, I encourage you to talk with your friends and family after the sermon to say, what is this going to do in your life? How is your life going to be different this week because you've heard the scripture? So here's this question. What does the Trinity have to do with our everyday life? Well, for one, it helps us to be more thankful so that we don't think that we have had any part to plan our own faith, that we can see that God the Father came up with a plan. You know, we can't come up with, you know, we can't take the credit for coming up with plan for our salvation. That God the Son came and died in our place for a debt that we could never pay on our own. And God the Spirit came down and convinced us to accept God the Son. So in every part of our faith, God is there working in us to save us. And for that, we can say thank you and live every part of our life with even more thankfulness. And as we see, this is part of the Great Commission, that we have been given a job as a church and as Christians, we all have to obey the Great Commission, that we go out into the world and we preach the Gospel. And the Gospel is to accept Jesus, it's to obey His commandments, and it's to be baptized into the name of the whole Trinity. And so as we go out from here, we can talk to people about the Triune God who saves us in every aspect of our lives. So you please pray with me in Thanksgiving. God, we thank you uh, that you are three in one. Uh, we know that we can never completely and totally understand that, but we ask that you help us to understand it more and more so that we can be thankful and tell others about who you are. And maybe even in that moment that we're telling them, you may be sending the Holy Spirit to convert them so that their whole nature changes and they want to accept you and be saved. For all these things in your name. Amen. Now, will you please continue in worship as we stand and sing together in number 407? God has spoken my chorus.